welcome uh, to this seminar. Uh, my name is uh, Trygve Augusta, and I'm the regional director for Norwegian People's Aid in the Southern Africa. Um, and we are so happy to, to welcome you here uh, for a talk about uh, joining forces between the labor unions and the civil society. Um, and that's our background. And Norwegian People's Aid was uh, started by the labor unions in Norway 75 years ago this year, uh, in the late 30s. Uh, and since then, that has been our constituency in Norway. Uh, they are still collective members of NPA, as well as we have individual members. So labor, the labor unions and NPA in that way is more or less the same thing. Uh, we went abroad as an organization in the, in the mid-70s to support uh, the independent struggles, for example, in this part of the world. We supported the independent struggles here in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, and Mozambique, for example. These days, these, days, these independent movements are in power. And, uh, and there's a change of, of politics and also the change of partners that NPA engage with. Uh, we think it's extremely important that all the bigger and the broader civil society join forces to be able to address uh, the issues that uh, faces the majority of the people uh, in this part of the world and in every part of the world, I guess. Uh, the inequality is, is high and is rising. We see uh, a lack of distribution of resources and especially the local communities are not benefiting from those resources. Um, we have many good examples of uh, labor unions and civil society working together. Of course, we have also challenges where it's been hard for the trade unions and the civil society to come together and address these issues. But we hope for, for this panel and these participants you see here and for the for the next panel coming afterwards, we will be able to, to learn and to share experiences and maybe also discuss some of the challenges we see. So with those introductory words, um, I'm looking forward to, to listen to the discussion. I hope you will, uh, will join in uh, and ask questions. And I'll leave the, the microphone to, to Saxis, which is going to host this first panel. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Trigve. My name is Fazila Farouk. I'm the Executive Director of the South African Civil Society Information Service, and I would like to welcome you all to this panel discussion on the relationship between labor and civil society and the struggle for social justice. Before I talk about the panel, just a little bit of information about my organization. Uh, SACSIS, the South African Civil Society Information Service, is a non-profit news agency we write social justice news and analysis. We feed that analysis to the mainstream media. Uh, the reason we were launched was because we wanted to influence a pro-poor agenda in the mainstream media reporting. We were launched six years ago. Uh, since our launch, we've done quite well. About 70% of all the social justice articles that we write actually appear on the opinion pages of South Africa's daily newspapers. We work with a team of writers from civil society. Um, these are all <coughs> experts in their field and senior people. In fact, on the panels that we're having this morning, two sexist writers are speakers on the panels. Uh, so we don't work with journalists. We actually work with activists from civil society who write and try to influence mainstream debates. Coming back to the, the reason for the panel that we're hosting this morning. I, mean, I think Trigov uh, raised a very, very important point about growing inequality in the world. We have seen the impact of neoliberal economics on global economies and on global populations. We've seen that it has raised inequality. We've seen that working, po working people are unable to make a living for themselves and pull themselves out of poverty. And that has highlighted the, the significance of labor movements and civil society activists coming together to collaborate and coordinate and develop strategies to help the most marginalized sectors of society. 
Um, and I'm not going to talk very much more about that because I have a wonderful panel who's going to get into the detail about it. I'd like to introduce you to my panel this morning. We have Leonard Gentle, Ingeborg Moer, Vigard uh, Grosvi Venisland, and Dinga Sikwebu on the panel this morning. Um, let me tell you a little bit about each one of my panelists before they speak. Um, Leonard Gentle is the Executive Director of the International Labour and Research Information Group. It's an NGO that produces educational materials for activists in social movements and trade unions. He's also a, a, a columnist for Saxis. And what he's going to talk about this morning is he's going to kind of sketch the context about where power is located in society and why these partnerships are important to challenge the status quo status quo and to challenge that power. Following uh, Leonard's input this morning, once he maps the context, we're going to look at international examples. So In Ingeborg and Vigard are going to follow up and they are an actual concrete working example of a civil society and labor partnership. Um, and they're going to talk about how the partnership works and they'll also highlight some of the campaigns that they're focusing on together. Ingeborg Moa is the political advisor of the Secretary General of Norwegian People's Aid. She has experience from the Middle East, especially from Palestine, and from Southeast Asia, including having been the country representative for NPA in Myanmar from 2008 to 2011. She's been involved in campaigning in Norway and Europe in cooperation with trade unions and the broader Palestine solidarity movement with the aim to stop trade with the investment in any companies complicit in the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories. Vigard Grosli Venisland is an advisor for the Norwegian Union Federation of Trade Unions, um, Fellas Verbunde, and works mainly with education issues. He is former head of the Oslo branch of the Labour Youth in Norway. Um, so Leonard will be followed first by Ingeborg and then uh, Vigard. And then finally, We've got a very special speaker on our panel this morning because we've got a member from the labor movement in South Africa, a trade union that's very much in the news and in the spotlight at the moment, and the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa. And we have the coordinator of the United Front with us this morning. The United Front is a special initiative. It's a new initiative that's being born because of the problems affecting poor South Africans. It is an initiative which the labor movement or this trade union is driving to set up a partnership between itself and civil society organizations. And Dinka will tell us more about it, but I understand that the United Front is being uh, launched and established <coughs> to see if we can establish a movement for socialism in, in South Africa. Am I right about that? Not quite. Not quite. All right. Well, you, you'll elaborate and, and explain a little bit better what the United Front is all about. Um, but having said that, let me hand over to Leonard Gentle, who will map the context for us. Leonard. Thank you. Can I just talk? Please? Yes. Sometimes intimidated by all these things. Um, it seems in, to me, in talking about uh, social justice um, and then possible relations, alliances between civil society and trade unions, there's like three things on the table. And I want to briefly reflect on different meanings of each of these things and uh, look at the possibilities of social change if we take one sort of line of reasoning, but also threats that things can go in the opposite direction away from social justice if other paths get followed. So that there's, a, there's both opportunities and challenges for each of these things. Uh, in the time available, obviously one can't uh, spend hours delineating each one, so I'm going to make a few assertions. And the first assertion is that um, the issue of social justice is a political question. It's a political question about power, about contesting the fact that the cause of social injustice 
is the fact that elites in the world now control things to this extent that whether it's called <laughs> austerity programs in Europe, whether it's called structural adjustment programs in Africa, whether it's called anti the war on terror, all of these are manifestations of a global elite that has successfully been able to distance itself so much from democratic processes in every country in the world that people, ordinary people, have very little capacity or appear to have very little capacity to challenge that power. So that the sources of inequality, the sources of poverty, homelessness, violence, sexual abuse, etc., can be traced in very different ways to the sort to the, the powerlessness of the majority of people in the world and the entrenchment of political power over us by a global elite. And what follows from that for me, again as an assertion, that if we want to talk about social justice, then we are in, <coughs> we, we have to be speaking about challenging that power. And we have to be speaking about how the ordinary people build movements of resistance against that power? How do ordinary people successfully build counter power to that power? And so that the, the question of power is at, the, is at the center of whatever we contemplate when we think about social justice. But there are three dimensions to that, the one is that social justice is not only an objective of some new society, socialism, whatever, but it's also a process of how we get there. It's also how do people participate and have their own agency in ensuring that. It cannot be done through some kind of benevolent despotism and so on. Now the first thing that follows from that for me is I'm a little bit of a critic of this notion of civil society and, and, and the sense that uh, uh, the notion that largely NGOs, non-government organizations, largely organizations of professional people who are in the business professionally of doing either lobby lobbying and advocacy or doing alternative policy analysis or research or developmental work or whatever it might mean. And I don't question the integrity of people, but in essence, uh, these are professional institutions that somehow make governments accountable, work closely to hold governments accountable. Now, I would argue that if that's the perception of what constitutes civil society and what its role may or may not be, that's a very limited notion. And in fact, instead of challenging the power in the world, instead of chal challenging the power of the global elites, one can become complicit in those power relations. You become complicit because you allow these elites to continue their rampaging across the world and you're the sort of band-aid or the ones that uh, uh, appear to uh, particip uh, participate in the form of public participation, but you're not changing those power relations completely. So the, the first challenge is to say we need to have a different understanding of what constitutes that, compart that part of the triangle. Now, if we grant the notion that challenging for social justice is also about agency of ordinary people, then we need to look across the world and say, where are ordinary people, poor people, oppressed people, actually active in acting as agents of possible social change? And how does one center one's perspective on the possibilities on those challenges and those struggles that are happening? Um, now, in South Africa, for instance, we've had, a, we've had a very strange phenomenon that we achieved democracy in 1994. Um, we have a, our government embracing all the sort of precepts of neoliberalism in policy, etc. And then there's a, a kind of buy-in of everybody almost into the, the rules of the game has been shaped by this new order. And yet, for about 15 years now almost, People in communities across the country have been what sometimes the media call service delivery struggles. In other words, people have been contesting the fact that they have no housing or they live in shacks or they have their water cut off and so on. And that, 
they are expressing their agency in the form of protests and blockading the streets and so on. But polite civil society sees it as either criminality or something that interferes with the smooth workings of society, or they ignore it completely. And so you have a, a kind of collusion of civil society within the rules of the game of how our society is structured, and in the meantime, a kind of a revolt of the poor continues. <coughs> and so the first challenge, if you want to have social justice in South Africa, and I, I would imagine these, they are equivalent challenges in every other country in the world, is how do those people who identify with the cause of social justice make common cause with these struggles around livelihoods, around resistance against uh, water cutoffs, and so on and so forth. So, that, so in other words, it's a challenge to this notion of civil society to move beyond the NGO framework and to begin to express, to make common cause, to learn from the experiences of those struggles. And in the course, maybe transform what is considered to be civil society and con transform the way people who are working NGOs act and practice what they do. So, so that's one part. Now, then there's the other part, and that's the labor movement. Because historically in South Africa, certainly in the struggle against apartheid, the labor movement played a very, very vital role as the kind of, often the nerve center of the anti-apartheid resistant movement. But we've also seen the labor movement post-1994 largely become complicit within the new elite. Uh, doing what trade unions do, which is collective bargaining, going on strikes, etc., but within the rules of the game. So we mustn't understand strikes and so on as necessarily and counter systemic social justice movements, but that's the sort of ordinary rhythms of what unions do. So in the main, they became complicit in these things and largely stood outside these struggles. And so there's a huge challenge to the labor movement, again, because historically the, the strength that the labor movement could bring to broader societal struggles is its centrality as an organized force that has the power, merely sometimes by striking, by stopping production, to actually influence power relations in society. Now, there, there are challenges to the labor movement also in this period. And the challenges are, for me are threefold. Firstly, politically, and hopefully that political question is being resolved now with the expulsion of Baikosatu of Numsa. Politically, in that the labor movement was very much aligned and uh, uh, complicit politically in the, in the sort of neoliberal project in South Africa. The second question was, is an organizational question that historically the labor movement rested on a, as, an, as a formation amongst the working class. But the working class has changed quite dramatically after 30 years of neoliberalism. The workplace no longer looks the same. The nature of work doesn't look the same. The composition of what constitutes this notion of a working class has also changed fundamentally. And the in my opinion, is often not a match between the industrial, traditional industrial trade union form, and this is not only a South African issue, I think it's in Norway, it's in every country, and the actual composition and state of the largely casualized, informalized, partially uh, employed working class, and partially, and sometimes even at the sphere of reproduction, the working class is experiencing such challenges, and the trade union forms often doesn't fit that. So the third leg of civil society, social justice, and is also a challenge for the, for the trade unions to conceive things differently, to also begin to make common cause with struggles of pe people that have been the revolts of the poor, as I've mentioned, and to have that kind of openness to contemplate other ways of organizing, organizing people, as I say, who are partially employed, casually employed, people who are home workers, and so on but also to have other forms of collective bargaining that don't fit the realms of what are very narrowly defined labor relations laws in this country, as again, as exists in other countries. And, and I suppose where I'm getting to that we can contemplate a movement for social justice to challenge this counter power, to, to, to provide a counter power if those who are in the sort of professional sphere of NGOs can contemplate other ways in which they relate to these emerging movements of resistance on the ground and contemplate other ways of providing support 
and drawing inspiration from those movements. And if the trade unions can begin to conceive of organizing differently to establish and build themselves on the new ways that the working class has been restructured, and in that way begin to blur the distinctions between the workplace, the home, the community. And to say that, that's not just an ideological thing, but that's the reality of how our world has been constructed. And if we can contemplate and if these forces can act in ways that can cross those barriers, then possibly we can have emerging a counter force driven by popular movements that challenges these global power elites. And out of that, we can begin to see the first sort of seeds of something that can challenge the power that currently is the cause of inequality, poverty, and so on. So it's a political problem, and we need to respond to the political problem with the concept of a new political mass movement. That's my sense. Thank you very much. Ingeborg. Thank you so much. I'm very humbled to see so many friends, uh, activists from around the world here. Thanks a lot for choosing our panel of the many that you could have chosen. Um, I just thought I wanted to get a little bit of a sense of who you are before I start speaking. So can I ask you, sort of just hands up in the air, who of you would mainly associate yourself with civil society work? Okay, good. And, and who would mainly associate themselves with trade union uh, movement and work? And some are both, of course. Okay, excellent. No, I'll stick to the time because I of think, them have both. and some of them have definitely both, like a shock. <laughs> um, so I would like to really take some time for for discussion with all of you. So let me try and, and be short and, and to the point. Um, as was said, I've mainly worked in practical cooperation with the unions in Norway and also in Europe on the issue of Palestine. Um, as Trygve said. NPA is the humanitarian and solidarity organization of the Norwegian trade union movement. Our main aim in our work is, is to challenge um, the, the current unjust distribution of power and resources, to work for a world where there is a more just distribution of power and resources. It goes through everything that we do. We're 75 years old this year, as Trygve said. We're a young and energetic 75-year-old, though, so we'll keep it going for another 75, I hope. We have representatives from the unions on our board, but we're an independent organization in, a, in that way. But we do have almost a million members if you count the members of the trade unions. So we're a big membership movement and we have around 13,000 members individually. I think so for us as an organization, and this is also speaking a little bit to Leonard's point about NGO versus uh, si uh, social movement, civil society, we aim to be more of a social movement than of a traditional NGO. But I say aim because it's a big challenge um, with the way the system is set up with donors and, and so on as well. So it's something that we struggle for. I'm not going to claim that we succeed all the time, but at least being a, a child of the union, it's easier for us to, to do that. That's more of our identity. I um, wanted to mention, to talk a little bit about a very specific campaign and then draw some examples from that on what I think have for us been good <coughs> principles of cooperation with not the union that Vega represents today, but another one of the really large unions in Norway called the National Union of General Municipal um, Employees. We've worked with them on Palestine in several ways. And one way has been that we have organized the members of the unions. Representatives from each county in Norway have been chosen through the membership of the union to become involved in the Palestine solidarity work together with NPA and the broader movement. Both to learn more, go to Palestine and so on, but moreover to bring the knowledge then back to the local unions. There are 19 or 20, depending on how you count, counties in Norway. There is now a union rep in each of those counties, specializing on the solidarity struggle with, with Palestine, so to speak. Uh, so that's one part of it. And they also support projects that we have specifically in Gaza and, and also in the West Bank. And then we've worked a lot, um, as Fazila said, with companies, and other actors that are complicit in the occupation. And one of the examples I want to talk about today is G4S. I believe they are still in South Africa. Yeah, so I'll tell you the story of how we kicked them out of Norway. Um, 
they are a security company and they are involved in a number of issues with to do with the Israeli occupation. I mean, another thing that we can talk about relating also to how the system works is that the occupation, as so many other um, things in our world, have sort of been privatized, as I say. It's been, the op occupation is out on tender in many ways. So there are now lots and lots of private actors directly involved in the oppression. G4S is one of them. One of the things that G4S is involved in is, for instance, providing security services to Israeli prisons where Palestinian political prisoners are being held. So that's just one example, um, but it's, it's an important one. G4S were involved in a lot of providing security services to un universities in Norway, to private companies, to, the, to public um, uh, entities, and so on. We started working campaigning against the presence in Norway, and at the same time started campaigning to have both the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund and Norwegian private banks and investors divest from G4S. The campaign in Norway was maybe the most interesting one to us. Um, we started up in 2012 by writing a report on Norwegian ties to the Israeli occupation, where we mapped all investments, all trade links with companies involved in, in the occupation from Norway. This was our basis. Then we started campaigning and chose a few targets in cooperation with the unions. And G4S was one of them. We then linked up with unions and civil society, activists who are more independent doing direct action, <coughs> the Palestine Committee and other solidarity groups in Norway and also in, in Europe. The first big victory we had was when the University of Oslo in the tender process that they had for security decided to exclude G4S on the basis of um, the breach of international humanitarian law and human rights that G4S, it was very explicit. This became of course a court case, you can imagine and so on, but the, they stuck to the issue. The next interesting part came when the, union, when the University of Bergen decided to not go for G4S in another tender process. And I'll come back to how the unions and our members and so on were involved. They cited reputational risk. The G4S bid was the lowest. They still cited high reputational risk due to the activities in the occupied territories for excluding G4S from the tender. Several other things happened until in January 2014 this year, G4S announced that they were selling their Norwegian part of the company to a Norwegian company and leaving Norway. Of course, they wouldn't say that our actions were the reason, but we are pretty clear that, that was the campaign was the success. Of course, now they are out of Norway. They are not out of the Palestinian territories, um, but the campaign continues internationally and we continue to be involved. If I have another two minutes or or three even. I would like to say a little bit about what I think were <coughs> principles for the success of the campaign, because it's also led to an increased cooperation with us and the unions on this issue, now focusing on other companies based in the Palestinian territories, such as SodaStream, which has a factory on occupied land. We found that it was very important to engage both the leadership of the union and the leadership of the NGO in our, on our side, that, th there were, that they were clear that they were supporting this, but perhaps more importantly, to engage the local chapters and the members on both of our sides. Hence the connection up to these 19 representatives in each county that have a responsibility for the campaigns and for their constituency, so to speak. So this connection between, if there was a format, you know, between leadership of the union, leadership of the NGO, members and local chapters, and the interaction between them was very important for the success. For instance, when we went in to look at tender processes in municipalities where G4S could be included, the unions were the ones who had members working in the municipality. And they were the ones who found out when G4S would be when it would be possible or likely that they were joining the tender process and it started from there. Um, this happened in, in several instances. So it was very important for the campaign to have that membership basis and be locally based. 
using our differences strategically rather than trying to demand that like the other became similar to us because there are differences with the way the unions work and the way that a civil society movement or, or NGO works but we found that using that um, strategically was, was uh, very useful. Making sure, and this I know that all of you guys know, so it's a bit of a mute point, but when I speak about this in Norway, I always raise it because it's, n it's not necessarily a principle that all campaigns follow. Making sure that the people you're trying to convince, whether they are municipalities, the government, or the bank investors, that they know, of, they are aware of your potential to mobilize. And this was very, very key to us in the collaborating with the union because we could say, well, we have 350 members of Fagforbundet, which is this union. We have 13,000 NPA members. We have 900 collective members of the union. They're all behind this campaign. And they can mobilize if, if, it doesn't, if it, things don't change. I'll end with a, a, a point that I thought, think is important um, for our... our um, ability to continue and motivation and everything and I'm not the person who likes to brag but we always said to all the people who worked with us plan to brag about your success so when the University of Oslo excluded G4S we bragged in the media we were out there we were talking about it it gives your members the motivation it gives the media something to write about it plans for the next stage so celebrating each little step but keeping that big long struggle in mind and keeping on um, also after the small successes was very important for us. So that's just one example of a sort of practical cooperation um, between a union and a, and a social movement NGO in, in Norway and Palestine. Thanks Ingeborg and I'm sure we'll drill more into strategy in the discussion session which I'm very curious about. And now giving the, the trade unions perspective, we're going to have Vigard uh, speaking. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very, very glad to be here. I'd like to start with a few words of uh, one of the pioneers of the Norwegian uh, labor movement, uh, also uh, a member of uh, the Labour Party, who said uh, when he wanted to describe uh, during a Labour Day speech, he wanted to describe uh, how it was to be part of the labor movement, he said, that we stand with our feet firmly planted on Norwegian soil, but with our eyes and looking abroad. So every labor day speech almost that I've ever heard in Norway has this um, international solidarity and this attention towards what's going on outside of our borders. Uh, and uh, uh, I like to think about this when I uh, travel abroad and especially when I'm here uh, as a representative of uh, a Norwegian trade union uh, and like to think, uh, you know, far away from home but still with people who, who you know, share and believe in these values. Fellesforbundet, um, just to give a brief uh, on what that uh, union is, we organize people uh, in the metal sector, uh, in the industry, uh, but it's a, it, it's a broad union. We also uh, organize people in, uh, in the construction and in uh, hotel and restaurant. Uh, so um, uh, it's broad and we are the largest union uh, in the private sector in Norway. Uh, why do we cooperate with uh, the Norwegian People's Aid? Uh, well, uh, like Trygve said, uh, the Norwegian People's Aid it, it's a a child of the labor union. But I think, um, and it, it's based on these values that we think that we believe that there are people who, who outside of our own countries, outside of our membership base, who, who uh, also need our solidarity. But I think um, uh, it's important to mention, as Ingvoy said also, that uh, the MPA is independent. Uh, we as a trade union, are focused on what we do best, uh, you know, organizing, collective bargaining, um, helping members. And then we can leave for the Norwegian People's Aid to do what they do best, international solidarity work, uh, work with civil society, development assistance, and so on. They also have national programs as well. Uh, and, but the ties are still very tight in terms of both funding. We have, as Ingeborg said, members in the board, and everything, but it's important that uh, we leave for the Norwegian people aid to do what they do. 
uh, best, and that we don't meddle in, as I say, in the politics of uh, the Norwegian People's Aid, but leave that to their members and their organization. When we, uh, as a trade union, we just don't want to support the Norwegian People's Aid financially. We do that, but uh, we also want to engage our members to uh, make them uh, want to be more engaged in what the Norwegian People Aid do and what happens outside of our borders. So we uh, support the Norwegian People's Aid program here in uh, South Africa. Uh, and, uh, they have their partners. We uh, cooperate uh, with them through the Norwegian uh, People's Aid. And we've, we've uh, recently started this, uh, but a year ago we organized it in a kind of similar way as Ingeborg described with the Middle East project that we have ambassadors from the different regions of, uh, of uh, Norway. Uh, we call them ambassadors. Uh, we, they've been here, uh, they've seen the programs, they've, uh, they've seen what the Norwegian people they do, work with, uh, you know, um, with the farming, communi uh, farming community, with, uh, with the fisher, fisher <coughs> men. And then we, uh, we, these ambassadors go home and, uh, what should I say, uh, preach, uh, preach the word of, wh of what uh, the Norwegian people aid is, uh, is doing here. This is how we've chosen to organize, uh, organize our support to the, with the Norwegian uh, People Aid. It's been a success, but uh, uh, it's also been challenging to engage uh, with our local members who are so far away from what's going on here in, in South uh, Africa. So now we are looking into a process of how to create those linkages between the individual members and the trade union work here uh, in South Africa. Because international solidarity is important, and our members gen genuinely feel that this is important, but nothing interests them more than union work in international solidarity work. So if they can identify with a trade union and the struggles they have, it's much easier, I find, to engage our members uh, than if it's, what should I say, and you know, solely international solidarity work. But if, it's, if the trade union uh, in Norway and the trade union in, uh, in South Africa can connect bonds, then I think uh, we, we get our members to look outside of their, uh, of their borders. And I would like to um, uh, talk about, uh, as an example of uh, one project which we work with internationally, which uh, has been, uh, uh, been a success and which has also been one that's, uh, that our members are very uh, concerned with and I think the South African experience might recognize the Qatar 2022 uh, World Cup. Uh, now, I don't think I have to go into detail about the situation there, but uh, to briefly put, we are talking about somewhere between one and a half and two million workers to build the facilities for the World Cup. They are solely, almost, uh, or uh, probably solely migrant workers. Uh, it's barely short of slave work. I mean, uh, uh, we had a trip uh, with our, uh, two of our representatives uh, down there, uh, meeting people living in you know, these camps. Uh, they have the kafala system which, in which um, a migrant worker is subject to a sponsorship from a local and the sponsorship uh, means that uh, the local is responsible for their visa, their stay and everything in the country which in principle means that the sponsor takes your passport and you're his for the duration of your stay. Uh, now, in, in this, uh, I mean, estimates have said that uh, with the current, I mean, rate of death at the construction sites, you're looking at 4,000 construction workers dead by the time the first ball is kicked in the Qatar 2022, uh, 2022 World Cup. This is also an issue which interests and upsets our members very. So we have a cooperation with the International, uh, with the international Labour Federation. We have, the, uh, we have our connections to the international you know, uh, labour movements. We were there on a trip with them and could report home on the issues. But also there, the contact with the civil society is very important to see how labor rights can also be connected to other issues in, in Qatar. So, so of course, um, uh, cooperation with organizations like Amnesty International has been 
very important to increase the campaign uh, towards uh, the Qatari administration for them to improve the situation at the construction sites. Uh, and uh, nothing is more embarrassing for some of these uh, regimes than bad publicity. And using that against them is, uh, is, is a way of uh, making things hopefully improving. And uh, you know, you get those promises, but then when you go and follow up on them, you see that little has changed and, uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, not going in the direction f uh, we want fast enough. But uh, I would use it as an example of where our trade union has um, uh, gone in a dialogue, in, I should say, have been active with civil society, but also with international trade unions to try to improve the situation. But there is uh, still, still a long way to go. I'll leave it at that and open for questions later. Yeah. Thank you very much. And our final speaker on this panel this morning is Dinga Sikwebu um, from the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, going to talk to us about the United Front. Dinga? All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Fazila. And uh, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. And uh, I look forward uh, to hearing uh, other experiences. And, um, let me just uh, start by saying uh, who NUMSA is. Uh, we are a metal workers union in South Africa, and uh, we have uh, close to 350,000 members uh, in the metal engineering sector, automobile sector, energy, um, and in the smelters, uh, which is sort of uh, steel mill and, and all of that. So we are the... Uh, the biggest uh, uh, trade union in South Africa. Um, and we were formed uh, in uh, 1987, but uh, our history goes back to the emergence of uh, black trade unions in South Africa in the mid 70s. Uh, um, we have uh, been affiliated, uh, or the trade union center that we belong to is the Congress of South African Trade Unions, uh, COSATU. And, uh, and COSATU, as you know, uh, since 1990, after five years uh, of its existence, when the African National Congress and other political parties were unbanned, uh, uh, COSATU formed uh, what they call an alliance with the African National Congress and the Communist Party. Um, so this alliance has been there since uh, uh, 1990. Um, last week, uh, uh, our union uh, was uh, expelled uh, from COSATU. Um, and uh, as we speak now, there is a, a meeting to discuss the meaning of this expulsion for COSAT and what we're going to do about it. Um, and uh, the reason for our expulsion for us is because as a union, we took a decision that uh, the COSAT, which we are affiliated to, must break the relationship with the ruling party, which is the ANC. And that uh, uh, what is needed is an independent trade union movement. Um, and for that, uh, we have been uh, expelled from COSATO uh, uh, because uh, the people in COSATO think that's a policy uh, and that we violated that uh, policy. There are other uh, 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 charges, but in the main, we see it as a political, uh, uh, the reason is political. Um, now, let me just say, because I'm supposed to speak about the United Front, where we took this decision for COSATU to break from the ANC, we also took uh, other resolutions and the two important one for this gathering is that uh, we 
as the union uh, should form what we call a united front. And for us, that united front is a coalition that would bring together trade unions, workers, and social movements. Um, and this would be around concrete issues. Uh, the second uh, uh, decision that we made, in addition to breaking from the alliance and forming the United Front, is uh, uh, that uh, we do think that uh, uh, the last 20 years in South Africa, what we have seen is a government that uh, uh, embraced uh, policies that uh, went against ordinary and poor people. Um, and we've traced this uh, uh, from the beginning of our democracy. Um, and we felt that uh, this embracing of neoliberalism by the ANC uh, requires a different path. So we think that uh, uh, the ANC has been captured as an organization by capitalist interest and that uh, there is a need for a party that will, be re will represent workers and ordinary people. So on one hand we are exploring the establishment of a political party but on the other hand, we have decided to establish a united front. The two are related, but they are separate. Uh, the united front is a coalition between unions, social movements, uh, uh, protest organizations, um, and it will be col collaboration between these organizations. And we hope that these organizations will continue to maintain their autonomy and will be working together on campaigns with them. On the other hand, we think that there's a party, but we're exploring that and a decision about what form and what we're going to do and the nature of that is something that we will decide in the future. So it's nice to hear uh, uh, people who say, look, uh, they are 75 years, uh, uh, because maybe we can sort of uh, learn how they've been doing this. We have uh, just uh, decided on this path in December last year and for the uh, best part of this year, we've been talking and trying to see how that united front uh, will uh, um, shape up. Um, the first uh, thing that uh, we, we did was uh, to see whether, what is it that can unite workers and people who are in communities? And we thought that uh, the issue of youth unemployment would be a, an important uh, question because uh, the people who are uh, under the age of 29, about 70% of, of them in this country are unemployed. So in March 19, we sort of mobilized a strike, uh, both by uh, unions and uh, the communities on this issue of youth unemployment. We thought that, you know, uh, because uh, the workers are parents and they send the kids to school with the idea that they will uh, get some jobs, it will bring us together. Um, so this is what uh, we've uh, taken. What we've also uh, been uh, doing is to bring uh, where there's a concentration of our members uh, together with community organization to form what we call embryonic united front structures. This is a path of discovery. We are trying to figure out how this animal would look like. And uh, over the last uh, few weeks, we've been uh, going around and taking up a sort of a localized uh, uh, campaigns. And uh, as I say, uh, the idea is not just to uh, support these local movements, but also to ensure that our members who live in those areas are involved in some of uh, these uh, uh, coalitions that we are establishing. Um, because we think that uh, 
uh, if I can take it, uh, Larry, your, your point. Uh, 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 what we've seen uh, in South Africa has been a sort of double movement. We've seen this uh, protest in communities. And in the main, uh, workers have not participated in them or supported them. But we've also, there's been another movement which uh, Lenny said is, it's not necessarily uh, anti-systemic. Anti anti but I think that uh, uh, if you look at deeply, I mean, this is now my argument, if you look at uh, why, for instance, there's been a rise if, of uh, strikes over the last uh, few years, except in one year, if you take the 10 years, it's been the, around the issues of wages. And uh, the reason why I think our members are taking up these demands is because that uh, they are unable to ensure that there's a livelihood uh, of their families. And therefore, we think that there is a basis, although it may not seem overtly political, but the source of these, uh, what are called sort of bread and butter struggles, is political. And, and therefore, we would want to see, and, and, and we think it's unfortunate that the people who monitor or comment or even uh, 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 do some advocacy haven't seen the sort of the revolt on the shop floor as also as part of the rebellion of the poor. Um, and, 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 and what we're hoping is to see whether these uh, can come uh, uh, together. Um, as I said, we are learning. We don't have a... We don't have a... a picture of how this united front would look like. We think that we should discover it as we work with the communities and hopefully we can find an instrument that can uh, uh, be able to take up interests of ordinary people in this country. Thank you very much, Dinga. <laughs> and let me just say as a representative of South African civil society, we on the left are very excited and energized by the news that NUMSA has launched this united front. And we wish them every success. So I'm going to now open the floor up um, for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ashok Bharti and I represent National Confederation of Dalit Organization, which is the largest platform of the socially excluded uh, Dalits and Adivasis in India. And, you know, so, uh, so my question uh, is little, you know, that there is a new alliances emerging, like the BRICS is one of the alliances where the South Africa and India both are there. And s situations are, you know, the particularly on the issue of the social justice, labor, and civil society. In all these BRICS country, you know, these are very, very critical ingredients that are emerging. And in these countries also there is a framework Constitutional framework, at least I know that in South Africa and India, there are very, you know, defined, clearly defined, articulated affirmative action policies are in place. So I was wondering that uh, how NPA, uh, because there are a uh, number of companies uh, which, uh, which have their roots in the Norway, and some of the company have roots in India and some of the company have in South Africa. How, you know, this whole issue of coming together of the civil society, labor movement, and the social justice, uh, the people deserving the social justice actually, that how we can uh, respond to, you know, in the context of the BRICS, uh, you know, that coming together. Okay, thank you. Um, Hand it to the person next to you, then there's one there. Well, I'm going to take it in threes. So this is the first round, one, two, three, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you very much. My name is Ernest Pararo. I'm coming from DRC, but I'm living in Norway. <laughs> yes, my question is for an NPA. I think they are doing a very good job here. And why they can expand the same job in the same African country where they are, they have, they have activities. What, in which way they can expand the jobs they are doing in South Africa with, okay. tra with uh, trade union in Kenya, in Angola, in Congo, in Sudan, in, you see? So Thank you. Because uh, of globalization, they should be everywhere. 
The second question from our friend from South Africa. Uh, what in your problem with COSATO? There is no problem of um, corruption inside or something like that? Mismanagement of found, something like that, of conflict of interest. As the people are in power, with uh, they benefit power from the government, and maybe your uh, unions, they don't have uh, any, some kind of conflict of interest. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Kamau Ngugi. Uh, I work for an organization based in Kenya, it's called the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders. Uh, we do a lot of uh, building networks at the community level. Uh, a number of issues have been raised by uh, uh, our panelists. Uh, I was touched by the issue of um, uh, the role that uh, civil societies and, uh, and labor movement can play. But I also have noted that uh, when it comes to labor movement, of course, their appeal would b be more straight to people who are kind of earning kind of a salary. Therefore, they're, able to, they're joining the movement. Uh, when it comes to uh, membership, you find maybe people who are on employment, as opposed to uh, a majority of people, and I'm talking from a Kenyan <coughs> perspective, where a majority of the people are not employed. Uh, have no jobs, are uh, quite poor. So you find that there's a whole group of uh, uh, category that is excluded when it comes to organizing. And I'm just looking for strategies on how we can in engage with this uh, very excluded but the most needy uh, group of our society that probably <laughs> the civil society or NGOs do not reach, at the same time the labor movement do not. Um, the other uh, comment I have is uh, on the question of solidarity, and uh, I think my colleague here from the DLC has also raised it, uh, how we can expand this kind of network to, to cover other areas, because where I come from, I am I'm, I'm concerned about the, uh, the new excitement in our countries where suddenly there are minerals and oils, and huge companies, uh, including from uh, Norway, coming to the country to do a lot of exploration and to of course, to be to join in the in the new uh, discoveries and to, uh, but the, our concern is that the the new gold rush does not come with the appropriate framework for respect for human rights, uh, or even framework for respect for lab, uh, labor rights and all that. So, how can we work together, particularly, for uh, to ensure the companies the, expo uh, the, exp the, the companies we're exporting out there uh, have a lot of respect for. The, ca the kind of laws that they would respect in their own countries. Mm. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to take another round. Um, all right, so we had a question around the BRICS framework. Um, is there anybody who wants to take that question on the panel? Lenny, do, do you maybe want to try and engage with that question? Yeah. Um, Obviously, Norwegian People's Aid will talk about expansion into Africa. Dinga, are you going to talk about, uh, you'll have to deal with the question around corruption or conflict of interest in Kosatu. Um, and the question from our colleague in Kenya. Um, also, if Lenny and, and Dinga could respond on the issue of, so how do we organize people and mobilize them if they're not organized in a trade union? Um, and of course, for the Norwegian colleagues, international companies um, being hypocritical in the way they <laughs> engage in the developing world. Okay, um, so Lenny, we'll, well, start, we'll start with the BRICS. Or that yeah, the BRICS issue. I'm not exactly sure. Let me just say what uh, my analysis of the BRICS is about. Um, and what it, to be honest, what it means for solidarity work and work in our countries, I almost want to say I don't know <laughs> what, what conclusions. But uh, I'm of the view that um, the BRICS is not just either just a vehicle for the big imperialist powers to get into Latin America and Africa. I, I'm, I'm of the view that that's not what it's really substantially all about. I'm also not of the view that sometimes within 
on the left, that people just focus on the fact that the BRICS are no different to the uh, Alliance, the G7, the G20s, and so on, so on. It's just the same old rogues. Uh, I think people are missing the point of something that is significant about the BRICS. And uh, my own analysis is that this is a, a, what I call a currency caucus. That uh, this is the issues around the BRICS bank, the BRICS deciding to have intra BRIC country trade in non third party uh, currencies. That's, uh, that's a, uh, what's the word, a euphemism for not using the dollar. That's what I'm saying. It's a currency caucus. It's a caucus that's a challenge to the dollar as the global currency, the currency of world trade and the reserve currency in the world. In that sense, it is a bit of a challenge to US power in the world, but through the vehicle of the currency caucus. And, and that, uh, uh, the, the country that is strongest in that is China. And that China's rise has largely been in direct opposition to uh, by you know devaluing the yuan and so keeping it low, storing up dollar reserves and so on. So this is a currency question. And all the countries in South Africa, my country in particular, uh, once is, well, is involved because our big capital, all our big monopolies have gone offshore. And their problem is they make their money in South Africa in RANDs. They are what we call RAND denominated companies, Anglo American, Anglo Plat, etc. Then, then they must be shifted and into dollars and pounds in the London stock market, etc. So the issue of the value of the currency question is a, is a strong and important question for the South African capital as well. So now, what is implication? That's what I'm saying. I must be honest. What is implication for what you do on the ground on this question? I'm not sure. Uh, it's hard to conceive of a march on the currency question. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's important to note that there's a shift in power. There's a challenge happening on the global level of power. And sometimes that opens opportunities, opportunities for movements to contemplate alternatives. I would argue that one of the major reasons why Latin American countries have been able to come up with policies and perspectives that are quite different to the sort of Washington consensus and so on, and get away with it to a certain extent, has been that opening of new sort of power alignments in the world. And, uh, so that's important, but again, I'm not sure how we would deal with it on the ground. So let me be honest about that. How we would take up a campaign or do something, I don't know. Okay. Um, Tinga, do you want to take up the question on Kosatu? Okay. Um, let, let me just uh, uh, say, um, uh, I just uh, one, one. we have uh, had uh, meetings uh, that involve uh, organizations uh, from the BRICS countries, uh, trade unions and social movements, particularly working on, on energy, so not on the currency question, because in that there's also all these agreements within BRICS on energy um, and we wanted to explore ways of working together on that question between uh, 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 the movements in these countries. But we can talk about more about that and maybe the next panel on energy can also talk about that one. So let me just a, a direct question on the whether there's any uh, uh, conflict of interest and you know corruption and all of that. Let me just uh, say, is, um, although these matters of uh, corruption, self-interest have not been at the center of the fight in, in Kosatu, uh, the unions in South Africa have become a, a multi-million uh, operations. Um, I mean, take my own union. Uh, we bring a, a 13 million subscription every month as income, and we spend that in procuring goods and services and all of that. So I think that uh, uh, besides the fact that mo most of the unions in this country have investment arms, just uh, the size of the union and the growth of the unions have meant that they've become sort of en enmeshed in uh, business operations, whether it's through procurement, it's, uh, whether it's through sitting on boards of uh, pension and provident fund, 
Um, and that uh, has uh, led to, I think, some of the problems in, in, the, in, the, in the union. It's, it's not at the center of this, but the, the, I think it will be uh, incorrect to say that uh, there hasn't been what I call a, a sort of some form of business unionism and uh, uh, at play. Um, so yeah, I mean that's 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 my. Uh, there was a uh, was there a question about uh, uh, maybe how you organize yes. uh, unemployed uh, people and uh, and this is a this is a big uh, 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 challenge. Uh, we have uh, tried, um, uh, for instance, uh, unions in this country, when people sort of lose uh, their jobs, they, they stop uh, being members of the union. So we have uh, uh, extended in our union what we call associate membership, meaning although you have lost uh, the sort of uh, your job, you can still be an associate member of, uh, of, 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 of NUMSA. Um, we are hoping uh, that uh, we can learn how to organize uh, people through this united front. But the key is, uh, again, to organize about those things that affect people. And I don't, I don't have to make examples, uh, because if you're going to come there and talk about issues that af affect employed people, then you are missing uh, a lot of people. So in, for instance, some of these areas, there are people like uh, hawkers who have uh, different issues compared to employed uh, uh, people. We are working with the uh, communities where the issue of housing is an issue for them and uh, it's important that they bring that into the, the coalition. So around concrete issues, I think we can begin to, to broaden the base beyond just the sort of employed sector, which is shrinking anyway. So I think there's self-interest in organizing broader. Yeah. Thank you, Dinka. Yes? No, you see, because I mean, the point I was making earlier about the challenge to the labor movement, the levels of so-called precarious work, unemployment, which is growing in the world. And, and historically, the labor movement, the trade unions have not been able to organize. Mm -hmm. um, in parts of Africa, it's a huge social problem because um, take Zimbabwe, you know, you get like 70% unemployment and then you have a ZCTU which is based purely on largely urbanized, uh, uh, sometimes public sector, some private sector workers, etc. And uh, uh, so, so it's, it's a challenge throughout Africa. And, and, and if, we don't, if we don't find ways of bringing together uh, things that... Now, how would that... What would that look like? I think I was saying there are lots of... We work with a, an independent union called Giwusa that set up a project called Masibambani, which was the uh, dismissed workers that, you know, that they welcomed back into a project. It's not necessarily usually successful, but there are some sort of attempts. But we mustn't belittle the difficulties of doing that. But the challenge is if unions don't begin to do that. If the, the United Front doesn't bear fruit, not only politically, but also organizationally, in terms of being to blur these distinctions, then the future of the labor movement is not a healthy one. So, and, and I'd like to think, I don't know, unemployment levels in, or employment levels in Norway should be quite high, one would think. But uh, these are, this is, the, this is the sort of music of the future. If the labor movement across the world doesn't begin to address these questions and find appropriate forms of organizing, and not also try to just impose the normal traditions of collective bargaining as the formula, and it may not be appropriate, but to find new ways of, of, of doing those things and, and to be open to the possibilities and the challenges that, that if that doesn't happen, we're talking about a problem. I mean, just to follow up on that, uh, I agree with a lot of what you said and, and figuring out a solution to that. I mean, if you figure it out here, please please let us know how you did that and, <laughs> and share it with us. But uh, I mean, uh, on a more serious, I mean, Norwegians, uh, we have very low unemployment. So that's not uh, probably the main issue with us. But our main issue is organizing uh, foreign workers who come here, who come to Norway uh, temporarily, because some of them stay. And you know, we're part of the, uh, we're not a member of the EU, but we're part of the e European Economic Area which means that there's freedom of travel, so we can uh, get labor to Norway. And, and they come. Uh, Poles are now the largest immigrant community in Norway. Many of them stay. 
and they will, with time, be more integrated to you know the the way the union works, and, and the, many of them are members. Uh, but uh, and we employ you know translators who who do who do good work, but organizing those people and they're in largely in the service sector who are only there temporarily. I mean the agriculture sector, mm. almost solely migrant workers. We, it's hard to organize. There for two months, work, home. Why should they become members? So this is, I mean, solving that issue is key to the, to the you know, a healthy future of the, of the trade unions. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, just to come briefly on how you know, trade unions can work in terms of companies abroad. I mean, um, we have workers' uh, representation in the board, like in the highest, uh, board, uh, highest positions in companies. And we spend a lot of uh, money and time on training and education for them in you know, uh, corporate social responsibility and these issues. Uh, I mean, it's not enough. We have to use political muscle as well. And I think, uh, so as a union, we do that, try to influence you know, policy makers. But, but that's one way of contributing to more uh, you know, responsible businesses. I'll pick up on that first and about the Norwegian companies in, in Kenya and so on. I think the issue is twofold. One is Norwegian companies, where I find that it's easier to work on influencing them. Like Vegar says, there are representatives on the board. We have quite good connections with them. There's, they're pretty, you know, some of them are 50% are uh, state owned still. Um, so there are special regulations around that and so on. But, but we do also work on that and we're part of coalitions in Norway who, who work on the conduct of Norwegian companies abroad. I think perhaps the more tricky issue for us at the moment is that we have a huge sovereign wealth fund. It, I think it vacillates between being the largest and the second largest after Qatar. <laughs> um, but it's huge. And the investments from that fund is really what we spend most of our energy on. Ma arguing that we as Norwegian people, that's our money, it's called the oil fund, right? It's the money from the oil extraction in the North Sea. Belongs to all of us. It's invested in 8,000 companies, I think, around the world, including POSCO in India, which Ashok knows, including a lot of companies in a lot of your countries where there are campaigns. This is what we spend most of our time on, campaigning on, on those sorts of, of issues. Um, so very interested in that. Also, the Norwegian government is putting out a white paper right now on bu the business sector's role in development. And we're very much taking the strong opinion that the important thing here is to hold the companies to account and to look at their own conduct in their production, in their supply chains, and not get into this sort of old-fashioned thought that CSR is about supporting a few projects here and there. And so we're very much into the process of writing that white, or <laughs> providing input to that white paper, uh, which will be will come out in the first half of 2015. Um, so hopefully, that will also put a good foundation, um, although it's challenging work. Um, in terms of NPA working in other African countries, I mean, what if you're an organisation that works with the aim of a more just distribution of power and resources? I mean, you can imagine <laughs> the the opportunities for where we should work are, are endless and so I think that that's, uh, that's definitely a possibility internally in the organization. I mean one good thing about being a membership organization is that things are really rooted. It takes a bit longer but we're not a foundation or you know a, a, a standalone organization <coughs> without, without members. So next year we have our, our um, um, congress in the fall and we're now in the strategy process of developing our new strategy and so on. I'm happy to give my email to anyone who's interested in giving input to that strategy process. And I really, really mean that. Um, it would be very good to have your thoughts on what should be criteria for an organization like ours to choose countries where we work. How can we support Ashok, as you were talking about BRICS? How can we support coalitions south-south, for instance? I'm very, very interested to hear from you. So please just contact me afterwards. Okay. Thank you. We'll take the next round. My name is uh, Nigel Martin. I'm with the Forum for Global Democratic Governance in Canada. And I want to uh, begin with, uh, which I really do, uh, to be honest, uh, but I want to begin with a, with a problem of definition or of terminology. Because I don't think labor is separate from civil society. I think labor is part of civil society. I think NGOs are part of civil society. I think CSOs are a different part of civil society. I think parliamentarians, when they get together, are part of civil society. Academics so, are part of civil society. So we have, 
we have the government, we have nonprofit, and we have civil society. Or we have profit and we have civil society. To me, those are the three sectors. So for me, and civics is, is composed primarily of NGOs and CSOs. So for me, we have a, a huge challenge. How do we, because I come from the NGO sector, how do we collaborate with labor? And I'll give you a, a quick example. Um, I was head of the Canadian Council for International Cooperation for many years. I was approached by a labor leader, and he says, we're on a collision course. And I was very surprised. We share the same values. We have the same social objectives. One of our provincial governments had decided to, to uh, farm out uh, health, work, health work from the, from the uh, private sector to the voluntary sector. And union jobs were going to be lost to volunteer organizations. And so we had a, we had a problem. And what my question would be to all, each of the panelists, if they wish, is what are the main constraints from your point of view of collaboration with, and just let's limit it to NGOs and CSOs. Thank you. Hello, Matthew Howe from the Lifeline uh, in Battle Civil Society Fund. Um, two questions, if I may, you can choose which one is answered perhaps. Uh, the first is um, I'm interested in the model of, of greater participation on boards from uh, union members and whether that has been uh, shared elsewhere and, and, and also reflection on the fight for that um, in, 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 in South Africa. And the second, um, just a question around uh, the state of ethical consumption in, in South Africa as well. Um, so uh, how uh, members and unions are working on um, ensuring that products that are bought are ethically sourced. Thanks. There was a, a very interesting question from Nigel for everyone on the panel, which was, you know, what are the main constraints in the um, NGO and labor relationship or the coming together? Mm. Um, so who would like to go for that? I mean, I think you I guys, think having you. had to, to do it, mm. can, can start that discussion. Well, I can start by, it's a very good question, and I, I also agree with you that labor is part of civil society, if you want to put up the triangle, so to speak, government, business, and, and civil society. Uh, practically, the main challenge, and I think this points to something that we could discuss more generally as well, with, for instance, the G4S campaign and other campaigns, have been, um, of course, there were union members working for D4S. So there were staff working for D4S who were unionized in a union that we cooperate with. So that took a lot of our time. And I think that's a constraint that we are going to continue to see and a challenge we have to continue to overcome in campaigning on private business and on investments, um, complicity, whether that's in the Israeli occupation or the occupation of Western Sahara or issues to do with the uh, oil, oil spills or, you know, any, any issues that have to do with private sector. There will always be a union organizing people in that workplace, at least if we're speaking about companies in, in Norway. So that took a lot of time. That was an interesting process. Um, I think you'd have to ask the union if we overcame it, but it, it, was, a, it was a challenge. So, of course, we don't always have... But in a sense, they said, well, we have a common point of view with you on the Israeli occupation. It's just that this is our job. And we like working for this company in Norway. In Norway, they're a good employer. They pay well. They allow the unions. I mean, there's nothing wrong with them here. We also disagree with the, their involvement in the occupation. So that helped. So I guess finding a common ground in, in the long run helps. But it's tricky, tricky. Vigo, do you want to offer a labor perspective on that? Well, uh, I agree very much on, uh, on what Ingebo said. Uh, we, uh, we sometimes get views from members saying, well, I'm not a member of this union to support some political mm. or social cause. I'm here because I want you guys to take care of my rights mm. at work. Mm. And we have to respect that. That's why they pay us, mm. you know, uh, and uh, so uh, and that is a serious uh, constraint. Now, there are other unions you can be members of in Norway, and we have like uh, outside of the main trade confederation, some members go to that union, and then we have to ask ourselves the question: Well, if we're without members, <laughs> you know, well, we're not really much of a union anymore, are we? So finding that balance of how far you can go in like a campaign that, that, that was probably more controversial that, mm. that the MPA went through with, uh, with the other union, 
is, is extremely important because then you can actually do a lot of good work and combine, uh, you know, uh, combine cooperation with, with uh, NGOs and, and CSOs at the same time as being, being a union. Uh, mostly we actually get this in terms of support to political parties during elections and mm. otherwise. Mm. That's when we have the most constraints. It's not, with, it's not mostly with the NGOs. I have to be honest, like with our, with our cooperation with MPA here, it's very, it's difficult. We have these ambassadors who are from different regions, they've been here, they're very motivated. They come home, they speak about it, they travel around the organization. It's been a year now. A year is quite a long time. They haven't, you know, been here back. So, so part of the reason <coughs> that I'm back here now is to find those. How do you find those concrete issues that will engage a whole movement and that a whole movement can agree on? It's it, it, they have sympathy and with, ha with the struggles of the union here. So that's not the problem. But it's it's to find those common grounds in which which uh, which our union which uh, members can share both the idea of the I should say the ideology or, or the sympathy but also have finding those uh, concrete small maybe but just very tangible things uh, uh, projects uh, or, or themes that you can that okay. you can agree on I'm going to stop you there because I actually want to bring Dinga in um, because I want to know um, that's a very good question around constraints and you making early initiatives and building early relationships. What are you finding as the constraints? All right. Um, I mean, my uh, sense is that uh, if you take a, an organization like a union, it's sort of membership based. Um, and in most cases, it's also hierarchical. Um, mm. and and the, what I call the wheels of internal democracy in unions uh, take a while to mm. turn sure. and make those decisions. Mm. Compared to a smaller, flatter organization, uh, it, the tempo is different. Mm. So we do, I mean, in some of this experience, you know, for, for instance, uh, uh, you get a, a, a NGO saying, uh, next week we're having a protest. Mm. And, and for that to be uh, agreed that we're going to participate in that takes a while in the union. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, what we're finding in, in our case is that some of these happen during the day, during the week when our members are at work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we can send a letter of support and do that, but we're not able to involve members because the rhythms of organizations mm -hmm. and the forms of organizations are a little bit... Uh, different, so that's that's what we we we, we it's find. It's a very yeah. practical yeah, yeah, constraint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The emergence of new forms of organisation is always <coughs> an issue of contestation, of discovery, of experimentation, and so on. But the reason why I'm saying is all those questions are related because for me this is the problem of our times. It, we shouldn't be looking at this of how do the trade unions, as they are organised now, make common cause with campaigns or whatever else. We should invert it firstly to say. If the trade unions are not prepared to experiment with different ways of organizing and breaking down these barriers and with instances of self organize they will die, they will become irrelevant. I mean, that's, that's as, as, as crude as it is, that that's what it will become in time. So the, the thing that NUMSA is doing with the United Front is something to be celebrated because it's not only about what will hopefully emerge from that process, it might be a political party, it might be a lot, but it will, be, it will discover all those informal networks, those informal ways that people do self-organize, that informal ways in which people have their own beginnings of politics that might not correspond with the politics that's debated in parliaments and so on. And, and sometimes we have to ride the tiger. You have to go through those processes. You have to honestly work in ways that don't put up these strictures and say, well, this is a union, this is not a union, this is civil society, this is not civil society. And actually take this up and, and, and let's see where that goes. Because as I said, that's the only choice. If we don't do that, actually we will also become irrelevant. But if we do, there is a world to win. I mean, that's as, it's as simple as that. Um. On um, ethical consumerism, um, do you want to? Yeah, I'll just uh, just to be quick, so that the other yeah. coming. The, the, the first thing is that there isn't uh, in South Africa a 
widespread participations on boards of companies, if I understand, like the sort of uh, European sort of model. <coughs> we, we, don't, we don't have that in, in the last scale. Um, and, and I was and curious about the movement towards that. Are you, how are you responding to that? No, 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 no. We, we, we for instance, uh, were sort of opposed uh, to that. In fact, in our law, there is a section that uh, caters for that. Uh, we felt that uh, it is true unions and negotiations and campaigns that you influence companies than taking positions on board. That's a little bit different with parastatals, where we have a position that in parastatals it's important to have people on boards of those. So that's, that's the approach of the South African labor movement. There hasn't been, in the unions, from, from my understanding, a deeper taking up of uh, this question of ethical consumption and all of that. That hasn't been an issue taken up at this thank point. Thank you. So all that's left for me to do now is to thank the panel. Thank you very much for the great inputs. And thank you to the audience as well. You were a little bit slow arriving, but once you arrived <laughs> here, boy, have you been a great audience. <laughs> thank you for the great discussion. Thank you.